Psalms, all right? So those of you that have been in my class, we were, were studying the, uh, trying to learn the books of the New Testament, so we got halfway through them, uh, trying to, uh, trying to bribe them with some candy uh, to learn it. Uh, but uh, Psalm, in the middle of our Bible, Psalm 103, there was a man named uh, Frederick Nitschke. Frederick Nitschke was a famous German philosopher. He died uh, in 1900. And so it was in the 1800s uh, that he lived and he became famous. He, it's interesting uh, that he declared God to be dead uh, during his lifetime. He declared that, I don't know why anybody would listen to him, uh, but uh, he declared it officially. He was a um, son of a Lutheran minister, uh, but he became a, a self-declared immoralist, uh, one of... And, uh, theology and in philosophy, he became an ex existentialist, um, which uh, basically he denied anything about God. But one of the reasons, this is what he said um, one time he said, I cannot believe in a God who wants to be praised all the time. That was one of his statements. He said, that's why God is dead, and I'm not going to believe in a God who wants to be praised all the time. Well, in our passage in Psalm 103, uh, we're actually going to try to read the first five verses together. Can you handle that? All right, you're going to follow me, follow my lead here, but the first five verses, because I think uh, there'll be a blessing to you, and as I studied it this week, they've been a great blessing to me. Um, you'll see that there's 22 verses. Never fear. I'm not covering them all. All right, never fear. Uh, those of you that are here Sunday night, you're like, no, please, no. All right, uh, 22 verses. You only covered one or two the other day, and it took forever. All right, but we're just going to do five verses, five verses. So let's start in verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. We're going to look at an idea this morning, and we'll, we'll close it up at the end, and that is, will you be an owl or an eagle? Will you be an owl or an eagle? Or an eagle, and you'll understand when we come to the end of our message, and we'll try to compare the two. But we're going to look at this idea of praising the Lord. There were 16 linemen and two managers from Rocky Mountain Power Company in Utah. And when uh, Hurricane Sandy came and wiped out uh, some of the area in New Jersey, these uh, 16 linemen and two managers decided that they were going to donate a couple of weeks and they were going to travel out and give their time to help out uh, there in the recovery part of Hurricane Sandy. The whole goal was get them on some way, one of the guys said. Somehow, even if you have to lash them up, they'll be working on that for years, one of the linemen said. So they had uh, never seen such damage. Uh, they were overwhelmed with the damage. But a couple of the linemen, this is what they said. They were overwhelmed with the damage, but they said the gratitude that the residents expressed to them just floored them. They said, I don't think I've ever encountered a situation with this magnitude, um, the one man said with the Rocky Mountain Power Company, but he said, amid all the destruction and loss, the workers said it was the incredible gratitude of the residents that um, they remembered the most. One of the men said they were almost jumping up on our trucks to give us a hug. One man, Paul Garcia, said this, I got hugs and a few kisses, and that was from the men. Now, don't think anything weird here, all right? But, uh, but that, was, uh, that was for the men. It was just, they said they were overwhelmed with the gratitude that they received because they would come out and they would spend weeks and invest their time in just helping this community get back on track. 
Well, I think it should be as we come, not just uh, near Thanksgiving, but at this time of the year, it should overwhelm God of how grateful we are. And this morning, I want to look at this idea of blessing the Lord. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for an opportunity to look at this passage of Scripture. We love Scripture. We love that you have preserved it for us. And then we have a way for you to speak to us. Lord, we appreciate that. We would ask that this morning as we come to you, we, we want to hear from you. We want to hear just words of a man. We want to hear from God. And as always, we ask Holy Spirit to do what I can, and that is to speak to hearts. Lord, we claim your power. In Jesus' name, amen. So here is the passage right in the first verse. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Now, if you go through these 22 verses, and I would recommend doing that this, this week, look at these 22 verses, and you'll see a psalm that is uh, claiming and yelling out uh, praises to the Lord. It's one prayer in the Bible with no dismal mood. There's no petitions. There's no problems. It's just flat-out praising God. And we're not going to look at the whole uh, uh, passage here. What we're going to look at is the first five verses because when you look at this, it's, it's in essence a psalm of David, and I think David is kind of giving himself a pep talk. He's talking to himself and saying, you know what, you just got to get in the mode of praising the Lord. And sometimes it can be bad out there, and sometimes you can look around, and it can seem dismal, and it can seem uh, things and circumstances can get you discouraged. But what we need to do is get back to Scripture, start thinking about the blessings of the Lord, and what you'll find is you'll start praising him. So here we have in our passage, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that, is in, all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not, notice at the end of verse 2, all his benefits. And verses 3, 4, and 5, this morning we're going to take a tour. We're going to take a tour with David and let him take us around, and we're going to visit a couple of places in verses 3, 4, and 5 that will help us to see why we should be praising the Lord. What is the first thing we see as far as our tour? Verse uh, 3 and the first part of it. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Go down to uh, verse 8. It says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins. So later in the passage, he kind of goes back and he reviews this. And so our first tour with King David is going to a courtroom. So King David comes in and he walks into a courtroom and he's telling you and I, that's one reason why you and I should praise the Lord. Why should we praise the Lord? Because he says, he hath not dealt with us after our sins. I looked up these words. You see, you'll see three different words used for sin in this passage. Sin itself, you'll see iniquity and transgressions. All three of them represent different aspects of sin. And what David is saying, when he walked into the courtroom, and that's what verse 10 is saying, he did not deal with us after our sins. It's kind of a courtroom setting. He didn't bring, uh, bring you into the courtroom and you hear uh, the mallet coming down and saying, guilty. No, what you heard was mercy. And we experience God's mercy. Now, some here this morning, maybe you walked in and you've never experienced God's mercy. And part of that is that you know about his mercy, but you've never experienced it. And the reason is that you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. I feel sorry for you because God's mercy extends to you this morning. God's mercy is there for you. And it doesn't matter, the testimony goes right along with what I'm wanting to preach as far as this uh, first part. It's because it doesn't matter what type of home and what type of upbringing you had. I grew up in a good home. My mom and dad took me to church right when I was a little kid. I grew up in Sunday school. But there came a point in time that I knew I was on my way to hell. And it didn't matter that mom and dad were saved. I had to get saved. And this morning, it doesn't matter. You could grow up in the greatest home in the world, but have you experienced God's mercy? 
Have you experienced it? Your parents can't can bestow it upon you. No, it is a personal decision between you and your creator, you and your God. Have you experienced God's mercy? See, in the courtroom, in the courtroom, David came up upon the courtroom and he said, he forgiveth all thine iniquities. Go back to Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34, wondering where that is. The second book of the Bible. Exodus chapter 34. And this, uh, and those of you that have things written on your Bible or written above it, you'll see that this is the second time in Exodus 34, the second time that Moses went up into the mount and he was uh, getting the tablets of stone. That is the Ten Commandments. The first time that he got the tablets of stone, he came down and the children of Israel were having a wicked party. They, were, they made their own image. Here, Moses is up with God himself and the children of Israel make their own God. And man, Moses, when he came down, he was irate broke the tablets of stone, he melted, melted the golden calf, made these guys drink it. As I've always said, you think I'm mean. <laughs> All right, Moses was one bad dude. All right, you didn't mess with Moses. He's like, you know what? You take, you, you're, you're disgracing my God. I was just up with him. I'm going to melt it down and now drink it. So Moses was a little angry and so was God. This was God's chosen people. He had delivered them out of Egypt. They were in bondage and he freed them. And this is how they show gratitude. But notice in Exodus 34, we see Moses is back up with God. That's in verse 1. He makes two tablets. And then he's telling them to come up and he's going to talk with them. And in verse 4, he hews the two tabs of, uh, tablets of stone. Moses, wrote, uh, it says, rose up early in the morning, went up into the Mount Sinai. And look at verse 5. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Notice what his name is. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed. What is God's name? The Lord. The Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. That was God. Even after, here's his chosen people, and he redeemed them, brought them out of Egypt. He destroyed the Egyptians. He gives them, uh, he gives them everything they need, and they kind of reject him. But what is God? Merciful. That's his name. That's his name that he brought to him. He says, hey, I'm the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious. And this morning, you may have rejected God for a long time, but I'm telling you, the Lord is gracious. He's merciful. That's our God. And just you sitting here, he's extending mercy to you. He could wipe all of us out. He could, and for those uh, that maybe reject Christ, he could say, you know what? I gave you one chance. I'm done with you. But he doesn't do that over and over and over and over again. He pleads with you. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's our Savior. So in the courtroom, when the mallet came down, it wasn't that God is sitting there saying guilty. Instead, what did he do? He did say guilty but he put his son on the tree. And so as you walk with David in this courtroom, you see Jesus Christ, and there he is, manacled. There he is, bound, and he's led away, and you say, who is that man? It's Jesus Christ, and he's taking your payment. Jesus took your payment, and so there it is. Someone steps up, and in the courtroom, the psalmist, what does he see? He sees Jesus taking his payment. That's what God did for you. God had his son bear your reproach. Bear that sin. It should have been you. But we see the courtroom here. 
And in this passage, let's go back to Psalm 103. You look at uh, verse 11 and 12. Notice what it says. For as he hath not dealt with us after our sins. Remember, it gives the courtroom idea. He wasn't in there and he said, guilty. Get that man out of here. Now, that's what, what he said. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Look at, for as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgression from us. So how high, how high is God's mercy? I, I mean, you can jump as high as you want, but it's as high as the heavens. As the east is from the west, and those uh, that have studied scripture, we understand this, the east, if you keep going east, when do you ever start going west? You don't. You're still going east because the east and west never meet. So how far has he removed our sin? As far as the east is from the west. It's not coming back. You know, those people that say, you know what, I'm not sure. You know, I, 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 I got saved, but I'm not sure if I am saved. Well, who are you relying on? See, because of God's mercy, I'm relying on Jesus Christ and his payment. And if I had to rely on my, uh, on my own goodness and on my own uh, uh, things that I have done, guess what would happen? Man, I, I, I would be unsure of my salvation. If you had to rely on someone else, you'd say, man, they're a strong guy and they're a really good guy. But... I wouldn't want to rely on just anybody. I'm relying on Jesus Christ. I'm relying on God. And so God, we see, takes us, or David takes us to the courtroom. And in the courtroom, what does he reveal? God's mercy. This morning, that's my challenge to you. If you're in here and you're not saved, have you experienced God's mercy? Mercy, But notice what else he takes us. Look at the end of verse 3. So who forgiveth all thine iniquities, David continues on his tour. Who healeth all thy diseases. So let's step into the hospital now. So we get out of the courtroom. We get into our uh, travel bus. We take, uh, take a tour over to the hospital. And now on our tour, David steps out and he starts walking through. And you'd say, wait a minute. Are you saying that all my diseases, I knew it, I knew, and this morning we're going to have a healing service. Oh, I can feel it out there. I can, no, negative. No, I don't really believe that's what he was talking about. We tour the hospital for God heals, and I believe God heals diseases. We've seen that happen in our church. It's up to God's will. Uh, I don't believe, uh, there are some people that believe in a divine healing and so you're never, you're never sick. In fact, Robert Schuller and some of those others came up with this idea that um, there's a divine healing and all that. The problem is that I can visit their tomb. I don't know what happened to his divine healing, but I'm pretty sure that the divine healing left because now he's in heaven. Maybe. Oh, we always debate that with him. Uh, but, uh, but if he is in heaven, uh, he's now looking down and he understands that he got sick. I'm pretty sure he understands that very clearly, that he got sick and he died. If he's there, now he knows. So I don't think that the, the Bible's necessarily teaching on this idea of divine healing, because who healeth all thine diseases? Because even Paul, remember Paul in the New Testament, what happened to Paul? He had a thorn in the flesh, and we believe that thorn in the flesh was something that hindered him physically, and God didn't remove it. In fact, Paul prayed three times, please, God, remove this thing from me. And what did God tell Paul? My grace is sufficient for thee. So he didn't get divine healing. And I can tell you this, you or I are not in the same category as the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, I mean, I would think that God would say, all right, I'll give it to you. But what, is, what are we saying? Well, I think in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5, let's turn there quickly as we're 
looking at this. Look at Isaiah chapter 53. I, I think this is talking about a different type of disease. The first three kind of all deal with the same thing. Isaiah 53. Surely he hath borne our griefs. This is verse 4, and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression, our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes, what happens? We are healed. So as I come into the hospital, what do I understand? I understand that I was sick, I was diseased. Now, what disease was there? It was the disease of sin. We sing, uh, the kids sing a, a, a children's song. We call it the wordless book. What do we say? My heart was black with sin until the Savior came in, right? His precious blood, I know, has cleansed me white as snow. And the white as snow, that cleansing, that's a medical term. It's a cleansing. It's the idea that I was, I was um, not just dirty, but I had a problem. And it was a spiritual, it was a deep-rooted problem. In the New Testament and in the Old Testament, you'll read of some guys that had leprosy, and they were cleansed of that leprosy. And that leprosy was a disease. And that disease of leprosy is what you and I were born with. Not physically, but spiritually, you and I were born with a disease. It's called sin. And you know what sin does? It eats away at us. It eats us away, and it's destroying us. And if we do not get to the Savior, if we do not get to that hospital, and the great physician, Jesus, comes and touches your life, you'll never be cleansed. But no, you know what also is interesting? When he says, he healeth all thy diseases, I think he is looking ahead. Because what do you and I know? In heaven, is there disease? Is there cancer? No, is there pneumonia? You know what, I'm glad, especially at this time of year. All right, there's not going to be coughing. Do you ever notice that? I mean, there's a couple of guys recently, man, I thought, I thought a lung was coming up. I thought maybe a lung, a kidney, I don't know how deep. I thought maybe they might get a toe to come up and come out. I was like, wow. I mean, that is like a cough. They're like, Bleh. right, and there it comes out. Like, you know what? A cough drop isn't going to resolve that. But what do I know about Scripture? I know when I get to heaven, everything's perfect. And we've seen that over the past year. We've had a lot of people go home to be with the Lord. There's no illness anymore. Yesterday, there was a bunch of us at Phyllis Stockman's funeral, her home going. And you know what? She's in heaven looking down. She has a perfect body, all right? And I, and I think because of perfectness, I believe she has perfect sarcasm. No, perfect sarcasm. I mean, she's doing one-liners left and right because she's perfect, and sarcasm is perfect. So here we know I, we, we are walking around, around with David, and what is David? He takes us to the courtroom, and what do we see? God has mercy. He takes us to the hospital, and guess what? God says, I'll heal your diseases. But then notice in chapter uh, 103, verse 4, who redeemeth thy life from destruction. And this is going back many years Many, many years. I believe we got to go to David's time. And in David's time, you know of kings and uh, you know of armies and you know of conquering armies and you know of conquer the conquered. I believe he's thinking about a slave market. And here in a slave market, here is, uh, in, in, in this day and age, they would purchase they would purchase these uh, masters would come, and maybe it was then as a king. Maybe it was as a conquering army. We know of that with Daniel. We know of that with other folks that were taken. And uh, remember the little girl with uh, uh, Elisha. And uh, the army came in and took that little girl, and she served under the captain of the host. Remember with uh, Naaman. 
And so you know that that happened, and I think that David is remembering this because it says, who redeemeth thy life from destruction. And here I was, and here you are, standing at that slave market, and there's cruel masters, and they're going to purchase you, and they're going to throw you. Some of them were thrown into pits. They were thrown into pits, and they were kept down there. Some of them were used and, and abused. But it says, he redeemeth thy life from destruction. What does redeem mean? It means to buy up. And guess what? There I was. I was bound. I was there in the slave market, and so were some of you. And some of you are still there. And there's an auction going on. And guess what happened to me? Jesus Christ redeemed me. He bought me. And so did some of you. You experienced the redemptive power of Jesus Christ. And no longer did I have a cruel master. No longer that cruel master was done because now Jesus Christ is my master. And now I serve a risen Savior. Now I have a master that is blessed and has blessed me. A master that is bountiful and as we saw in Exodus 34, uh, man, his name, his name is gracious and merciful. He's long-suffering. That's my master. So why? This is my uh, challenge again to some of you. Here, uh, we're introducing you to Jesus here this morning. Why stay under Satan? He's never been a good master to you. You say, well, I, I've got some money. I've got some friends. i got some things. And yet you're still unhappy. And for some reason, there was a nagging that brought you to church here today. And that nagging was because it's not satisfying. Because your master, you know it. He's a hard taskmaster. Sometimes he requires things that you don't even have. Because that's Satan. And when you're alone, all alone, there's a sorrow there. And my, ta my master, not taskmaster, but my master, when he bought me, he doesn't just leave me alone. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's my master. But I, I, I'm, I, this is, it's dark down here sometimes and it's cold and it's hard to do things. He said, hey, I won't leave you comfortless. And my master thinks of everything. So as we're taking a tour this morning, we stop by the courtroom, we stop by the hospital, we stop by the slave markets, but look at what he says, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies and now it starts switching in our tour because it was all kind of depressing because you're in the courtroom and you're in the hospital and you're at the slave market but now all of a sudden I go to the palace and at the palace what happens from the pit he removed me there at the slave market and there I was in my dungeon there I was pitiful but man, he brings me to the palace and he doesn't just treat me as a servant. No, it says he crowns me. He crowns me with loving kindness and tender mercies. In the Tower of London are the British crown jewels, the imperial state crown, the one Queen Elizabeth wears for state functions. It's covered with 3,700 and 33 jewels, 2,000 diamonds, 200 pearls, 17 sapphires, 11 emeralds, and 5 rubies. It would be good to steal that. <laughs> it's one of the most precious collections of stones and jewels on earth. But you know what? Those fade away. Materialism, it vanishes. It's gone. But what does Christ crown us with? Loving kindness and tender mercies. That's what he brings to us. 
That's the crown that he brings. Things that are lasting. Things that are not just temporal, they're eternal. And that's our Savior. He brings us into the palace. But then look what else he does. In verse 5, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things. We're still in the palace. But now he leads us not just in the crown, the throne room, but he leads us and the door opens up and you can see the guest um, and then you can see the servants lined up and there is the banquet hall. And he's made it for you. Because that's our Savior. He said that he's not just going to crown us with loving kindness and tender mercies, but he satisfieth thy mouth with good things. That's why the psalmist could say, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. This morning, I don't know what you're going through, but on this earth, I was reading, I've been reading through the book of Job. And man is born to troubles as the sparks fly upward. You're going to have some troubles here on this earth. And sometimes just living in this temporal world, we can start getting down and we can start looking at the temporal things and saying, man, God, I mean, why is it like this? Why are you doing this? Ah, oh, stop. And turn to a psalm like Psalm 103. And David then takes you on a tour and he takes you to the courtroom and he takes you to the hospital and he takes you to the slave market. But that's not where he stops because then he takes you to the palace and you start seeing, you know what? It's not just about this temporal, it's about the eternal. Sometimes when we're down, we need to start taking our eyes off of ourselves and off of our things and start looking at what God has done, not just temporally, but eternally. Because what he has done is he has redeemed you. What he has done is he has pronounced his son guilty and you freedom if you will take it. What he has done is he has healed our diseases. He has taken away that blood of sin. And he's offered us salvation. And it's not just a salvation that gets us through today or tomorrow. It's a salvation that lasts eternally. And then he takes you into his palace and he crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. And then he puts a feast out there. And daily you can come and you can feast with Jesus. I was teaching our class this morning about intercession and prayer. And when Jesus, I told them about Jesus dying on the cross, and when Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says, and Josephus, the historian, uh, he, uh, he also has it in his writings. But the Bible is enough for me. But it says that the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom. What does that mean for you and I? That daily and as much many times as I want, I can walk in to the presence of God. Remember when we read about the story of uh, Haman and Esther and King Ahasuerus? Remember when Esther, she was worried about going into the king because this is the way it was. If you walked into the king, you couldn't just have an audience with the king. He had to hold out his royal scepter. But this is what you and I, as a son, as a joint heir with Jesus Christ, the scepter is always out. And any time you and I want, we can step into the presence of the King of Kings and we can have an audience with the King. That is what we have. So why are you mopey? Why are you down? You have an audience with the Creator. Why are you struggling along by yourself as a Christian? 
Why do you go along and you say, man, it's just so hard. It's a drudgery living here in this earth. Get in with the king of kings. You don't think he has an answer for you? You don't think that he has a solution to your problem? What you will come away from when you start on this tour, what you will come away from is understanding that the king of kings, that is my father. And I have a relationship with him. We said, are you an owl or an eagle? At the end of verse 5, what does it say? He takes a tour to the courtroom and the hospital and the slave market, and then he goes to the palace, and then he goes to the banquet hall. And after going on this tour, he comes away and he says, man, my youth is renewed like an eagle. But look at chapter 102. It's one before there. This is the Psalm of David. He's afflicted. Hear my prayer, O Lord, let my cry come unto thee. Hide not thy face from me in the day when I am trouble, in trouble, incline thine ear unto me. Look at verse 3. My days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burned as an earth. Hey, he's pretty depressed, isn't he? Sounds like some of you guys. But in verse 5, my heart is smitten, withered like grass, so that I forget to eat my bread. But look at verse 6. I am like a pelican of the wilderness. I am like an owl of the desert. You know, there may be something beautiful about an owl. I remember I was uh, doing a workout, I think, at the beginning of spring, and I came driving by, and uh, sitting on top of one of the electric lines was this monstrous owl. It was huge. But normally, we don't go up to it and say, like, wow, look at, I would like to be like an owl. It's kind of it's spooky, scary. You know, it's just, there's not something um, that um, lifts your spirit. You know, you're looking at like, oh, it's so majestic. That's not normally what people say about an owl. An owl is, we know it's nocturnal, it's nighttime. Actually, hoots. <laughs> I mean, whatever that is. It's not really a majestic, you're like, oh, listen. Hoo, hoo. Like, wow. Oh, I just, my spirit, it's lifted. No, there's something weird about you because you're out at night trying to follow an owl. <laughs> but what has it been for, <laughs> and really, think of America, all right? If we would have picked the owl as our national bird, most would be like, what's wrong with those founding fathers? Something's off with them. But what did they pick? Something majestic. Because here David is, after he goes through and he's talking about blessing the Lord, his spirit changes. And now he says, my youth is renewed like an eagle. When you really start looking at what God has done for you and you start praising him, you know what will happen? You'll get out of that nighttime hooting <laughs> and you'll start soaring like an eagle. It's majestic. It's exhilarating. And that's what praising the Lord can be in your life. There was a man that lived in England. His name was William Sangster. And in the mid-1900s, 1955, Dr. Sangster was asked to take charge of a home, uh, the home missions department in all of Britain, in the British Isles. He prayed and he sweated uh, about this, and he really believed that God wanted him to take it. It was in, in 1955 at that uh, day and age in the British Isles, there was a waning in, the, uh, in religion. There was a waning in Christianity, and he asked God to help him to uh, bring it back. Three, three years after he took this, in 1958, he was conscious of an uneasiness in his throat, 
and a dragging in his leg. He went on his work, but soon he could not avoid seeing a doctor and was diagnosed with incurable muscular atrophy. He, the doctor told him that the muscles would gradually waste away, his voice would go, he would not even be able to swallow. And he thought, wait a minute, I just started this job, I just started this work, there's so much to be done. In his words, he said, from dark despair, he battled through to triumphant ascent. He could still write, and he would have more time for prayer. And then he said, let me stay in the struggle, Lord. Against increasing limitations, he forced himself to work. And then he would tell sympathizers why I'm only in the kindergarten of suffering. Gradually, his legs became useless and his voice. He used to be able to speak to thousands and he used to, um, uh, his voice was just, uh, God gave him a powerful voice and it went completely, it was gone. Speechless and helpless, he still could hold a pen. And on and on he wrote. On Easter Day, he wrote one of his friends, and this is what he said. It is terrible to wake up on Easter morning and have vo no voice with which to shout. He said, I want to shout, he is risen. But it would be more terrible to have a voice and not want to shout. You know what he found? He found that no matter what happens, he could praise the Lord. The psalmist says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Heads bowed, eyes closed here this morning. It could be that this morning, as a Christian, God dealt with you. As a Christian, God may have dealt with your heart, and you've been moping around. You've been like the owl in the desert. You've been saying, oh, woe is me, instead of taking a tour like David and finding out that God has been unbelievably merciful to you. He's given you salvation. He pulled you off of that slave market, and he brought you to the palace, and he's feeding you in his, in his banquet hall. You haven't recognized that. And this morning, as a Christian, instead of, instead of flying like an eagle and soaring like God wants you to, You've been moping in the nighttime as an owl. God may have dealt with you, then you need to deal with that. But it could be this morning you're here as an unbeliever. You came in and you're not saved. You're not born again. And by that, what I mean is you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you would say, now I understand some of it, you talked about the hospital and you talked about the courtroom and you talked about the slave market, and I understand that now, that Jesus Christ redeemed me. He paid the price. He was made sin for me in that courtroom. But I've never accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. If that's you this morning, you say, I know I've never done that. Would you pray for me this morning? Would you slip up your hand? Is there anybody like that here this morning? You'd slip up your hand and say, you know what? God dealt with me in that area of salvation. I have never trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Is there anybody like that here this morning? All right. Anybody else? You'd slip up your hand. Okay. Anybody else? You'd slip up your hand. Say, God dealt with me in that area of salvation. Is there anybody else? Balcony? The wings? As a Christian, if God dealt with you, when the invitation's given, if you haven't been praising the Lord properly, you ask God to deal with your heart. It should be as a people of God that we should be able to say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is, all that is within me, bless his holy name. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for this opportunity to look at Scripture Help us, Lord, to be a people that praises you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Standing with